If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, the ushers have extra Bibles. We'd be glad to let you use one of ours. Raise your hand if you didn't bring one and use one of ours. Turn to John chapter 8, please. Yeah, like Phyllis said, I, I had uh, wanted us to have a fall social for a few years now, and for different reasons it just didn't work out. But uh, uh, somebody said, what's a fall social? It's when you socialize in the fall. <laughs> you know what a fall social is? Well, we're going to have one. So we're not celebrating Halloween. We're acting like there is no Halloween. We don't, we don't, it don't affect us. Uh, but no, we want, I wanted us to have a time when we came together and we're, we're not doing anything except just eating and fellowshipping. No singing, no preaching, just, you know, just eating <laughs> and talking. <laughs> just, just fellowship. Just get together and just have some fun. And all the little kids, you know, they're going to be dressed up in their outfits and we can watch them. Yeah. They'll be our entertainment, right? And just have a good time. And uh, so come out for that. And, and, and of course, we're, this is, uh, you can bring somebody if you want to, but th this is primarily for the family, you know. That's why we won't be advertising all that much about it. It's a different thing from the uh, Celebration Sunday, which is a strong outreach to the community and surrounding areas. But, you know, we've got a lot of people in the church, got a lot of new people, and uh, people getting to know each other, and it'll be an opportunity to, to fellowship and, and, and eat, of course. Uh, <laughs> I was watching that uh, uh, a parking lot team. Boy, I bet you'll have a lot of sign-ups on that, man. Free food. I mean, what, what's to ask about? John 8. John 8. We began a couple of weeks ago on a new series, and this is uh, our main text in John 8 and verse 31. The scripture says, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word. One translation says, if you continue to obey my teachings. The Amplified says, if you, can, if you hold fast and live in accordance to them, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Thank you, Lord. A lot of times this 32nd verse is quoted by itself, but you know it goes with the 31st, doesn't it? And he's talking about discipleship. And so much of what you learn, you don't, you don't just learn by book or by, by mind knowledge. You learn by doing. Think about it now. How many in here drive a car? Well, there was a time when you learned about driving from a book or from somebody telling you about driving. Hmm? But then things really begin to get real to you when you got behind the wheel. <laughs> right? And they didn't tell you how that you can't see the, the center line. <laughs> when you're in the driver's seat and so many things that just for some reason didn't come up or didn't click begin to click when you do it and the nuances uh, of operating the vehicle you don't really learn until you begin to do is that right? and so you know you, you've heard me say it many times around here it's only the doers that get results, that get the miracles, and then we confess, I'm a doer. I'm a doer. Well, actually, this whole series is about that. Because he said, if you'll continue in my word, or if you look at other scriptures and even other translations, it has to do with doing, living in and doing the word, you'll be, then you'll be my disciples. Indeed, 
and then you'll know the truth. Yes. One translation says you'll experience it, the truth. And as you experience truth, it makes you free, Amen. liberating. Isn't it good news about the brother that's experienced truth and has been free from alcohol for four months? I mean, that's a victory, brother. That's glory to God. I mean, he was that way for decades, bound, and now he's free. Well, what made the difference? What made the difference? He, he got a hold of the Lord's words, right? And he began to believe them and do them, and they made him free. He began to be a doer. So be, here's another definition of a disciple. The title of our series is Becoming a Disciple of Jesus. And what is a disciple? We looked up the words. Two of the basic meanings of disciple, one is learner and the other is follower. A disciple is a learner and a follower. If I had to pick one word to describe disciple after studying it further, I'd use that word follower. Vines bring this out, that a disciple is not just a pupil, which would be not just a learner, but one who imitates the master. And of course, we saw in Luke 640, Jesus said, the, uh, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfected, one translation says, completes and their, their development and training shall be as or even as his master. Oh, this is a high word, isn't it? What a glory. Is it, is it true that you can become just like the master? Is it true? Millions of Christians wouldn't even dare believe it. But I'm quoting Jesus. Luke 6, 40. Right? Red letters. You, you're not going to pass him. You can't be above him. Now, you know, a lot of theologians and preachers wouldn't have even thought to say that. But this is Jesus we're talking about. He says, no, you're not going to pass me, but if you'll follow me fully and develop fully, you can be just like me. Wow. Wow. That, that's wow. Isn't it? That you can think like Jesus. You can pray like he did. You can believe and have faith like he did. You can live and operate like he did. We can minister like he did. We can have things happen like he did. This is not one isolated verse. Didn't he say in John 14, if you believe on me, the works that I do shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do. Why? Because I'm leaving. Because if he'd have stayed, then it just got greater and greater and greater. And of course, there's still his works through us but they're supposed to just increase. That's why we keep saying it every week. Greater things than these. Shall we see why? It's the will of God. Greater in multitude, greater in magnitude. It's supposed to be happening. But now, there is a difference, like we said, between being a believer and being a disciple. Jesus said in John 8, 31, to those Jews that believed on him. They're already believers. Then he says, if, that's a conditional thing, if you continue in my word, then you'll be my disciples indeed. Truly, you'll really be my disciple. So it obviously is not automatic that you become his disciple just because you believe on him. And so what we're talking about now is becoming his disciple. Are you interested, friends? So... Last week, we got into some detail about the cost of discipleship. What's it going to cost? And we, if you weren't here, you can go pick up the materials. We got into it in some detail about what it cost and what Jesus said. Jesus went through a list, and th this is really a little different. But he kept saying, 
If you don't do this and this and this, you can't be my disciple. If you're not willing to do this and this, you cannot be my disciple. He said it repeatedly. So there is a cost involved. But when you, when you begin to talk about cost, so many times people look at it just in a negative sense. And there's been so much when you talk, talk about suffering or you talk about cost, sacrifice, people begin to get quiet and uncomfortable and don't really want to think about it and talk about it because the implication is, yeah, everybody ought to do it, but hardly anybody does, and let's just believe in Jesus and be happy. <laughs> now, go with me to 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy, the second chapter. Are you interested in becoming his disciple? Yes. Truly, really, yes. being his disciple. Well, it requires a greater commitment than a lot of people are willing to give. A greater submission and a greater commitment to him to follow him and be his disciple. Second Timothy, the second chapter, before we read this, we, t we talked about two uh, instances in the scripture that give us an idea of what kind of lifestyle a disciple is to have. Here we're about to read he compares it to being a, a soldier, highly disciplined and trained soldier. We read in 1 Corinthians 9, you don't have to turn there, but he compares it to being uh, and training like a top, we might say, Olympic athlete. They had the games in his day. And let me read that to you again. Don't turn there, but in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, in the NIV, it says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. We do it, we do what? We do what? Go back to the verse. They do it, they do what? Strict training. We do what? Are we in strict training? Are we supposed to be? Is that a foreign concept yes. to most of the church? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I reckon we ought to find out about it too, huh? Yes. It being in the Bible and all. Yes. The, uh, the Living Bible says it like this, verse 25. The Living Bible says, To win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things that would keep you from doing your best. Hmm? Does this apply to us some way? <laughs> uh, how many remember Hebrews talks about running the race? Lay aside air, uh, all the, the, the sin and weight, weight that is, and sin that would so easily beset you. Anything that would hinder you or slow you down and hold you back needs to be cut off, doesn't it? But see, we, we live in a no-sacrifice generation. We live, we live in, a, in, in a time and group of folks that don't ask me to give up anything. Well, the problem is Jesus already told us to. We, we read last week. He said, if you're not willing to uh, uh, give up everything, your own life, you cannot be my disciple. But instead of being sad and being down about it, we need to see it through the eyes of the Scripture here. Let me, let me read it to you from the, uh, the English version, 25. Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline. Say strict discipline. Strict discipline. In order to be crowned with a reef that will not last. But we do it, we do what? Submit to strict discipline. You know, I think that involves more than just going to church once in a while. <laughs> we do it for one that will last forever. Thank you, Lord. Uh, turn with
with me to another scripture before I get you got you got uh, Second Timothy. Well, let's just read that, then I'll give you the other. Second Timothy two, verse one. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What's the opposite of being strong? Being weak. I'm going to get ahead of myself just a little bit for a time here uh, and give you some uh, indicators of weakness versus strength. You can, you can identify weakness and undisciplined lifestyle by this phrase. It'll come up all the time. Two words. I feel. I feel. How many understand Olympic athletes reaching for the gold have to overcome what they feel? Hmm? You reckon they ever wake up in the morning and think, I don't feel like running 10 miles today. I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel. I just feel. You ever hear these phrases? Just look straight ahead now. You, you remember? I just, I just don't feel. I, I really feel. Do you know, even if you feel strongly about something, that doesn't make it true. Yeah, but I really feel. I just feel. Now we're reading about, what's the next verse here? He said, be strong, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 3. There therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What about in the military? They say, all right, you be at such and such place, oh, 0500. Do they say, ah, uh, I don't feel like it. <laughs> today Jesus soldiers do I said Jesus soldiers do it's 20 below <laughs> and the tank don't want to start it's cold I just feel like staying in today I just feel like there are people out there that don't like you with guns. <laughs> I just feel more comfortable staying here in the camp. <laughs> I just don't feel like. Are you with me this morning? Yes, this is the opposite of being strong. When you're strong, you don't talk how you feel. Right. Well, come on, help me out with this now. I so said, when you're strong, you don't talk about how you feel. You lay your feelings aside and do what you're supposed to do and believe what the Word says no matter how you feel. Hmm? If the Lord says He's forgiven you, it doesn't matter how you feel. I just feel so bad because I've messed up. Did you repent? Yeah. Did you ask God to forgive you? Yeah, but I just don't feel. Shut up. <laughs> the Bible said he is faithful yes. to forgive you and cleanse you. Now, by talking about your little feelings, you're calling him a liar. Hallelujah. Weaklings talk about how they feel. I, f I just feel. I, d I don't feel. I feel. Physical feelings, emotional feelings. Yes. Weakling. Strong men, strong women have feelings. Don't misunderstand me. You got them. But they don't rule you. You, you, you are disciplined to the master. And when he says something, you lay aside your feelings and you pursue what he said. Like a highly trained athlete. 
like a highly trained soldier. Right? right? Amen. You don't allow yourself to talk about how you feel. <coughs> Second Timothy 3. Therefore endure hardness. Endure what? Hardness. Not easiness. Some things are not easy. Hardness. What do you do with hardness? Endure it. How? Like a good soldier. Not just a soldier. A good soldier. Like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Come on, help me out. Now, what do good soldiers do? Good soldiers get their gear and go. No matter how hot, how cold, how bad, how dangerous, how they feel, good soldiers get their gear and go. They go. They go. So many people quit. They quit marriage. They quit their job. They quit their church. They quit their ministry. Because they got to where they didn't feel good. They didn't feel or they felt. I know, you know, in ministry, I've had people help me before. I remember we were walking to the service one day and some things had really happened that could have shaken us if we'd have let it. And they started to turn around. They said, I just can't do it. I grabbed them. I turned them around. I pointed them toward the platform. I said, here we go. <laughs> I just can't do it today. I said, we're doing it. We're doing it. Too many weaklings around. You don't understand what I'm talking about? I'm thankful for uh, the example that Phyllis and I had set before us uh, with Brother Kenneth Hagen and Miss Aretha Hagen. We were able to save, serve with them for 20-some years. And such good examples along this line. I'm telling you, we'd go out and, and, and minister night and day, twice a day for a week, two weeks, come in for a few days, change our gear, go back out again, and they're in their 80s. And uh, mom was faced with some health issues. Serious things. Phyllis would take her to serious treatments during the afternoon and she'd be dressed to the nines and back in the service that evening. And there'd be times you knew they didn't feel like it. I mean, you know, you've traveled over half the country. And I know when they were coming in, one evening we're coming in, actually, 1.30 and 2 in the morning, uh, on the plane flying uh, 41,000 feet and 500 miles an hour. Brother Hagin is sitting up with his feet kicked up in the chair eating pepperoni pizza. And he's in his 80s. I said, Dad, I said, you know, not too many guys in their 80s ripping through the air at 2 in the morning at 41,000 feet, 500 miles an hour eating pepperoni pizza. He laughed. He said, yeah. He said, the doctor said most people my age was dead. But they, they had a sense of duty. Oh, come on now, duty. We got a call on our life. And I've seen him and I've seen her. You knew they didn't feel good. You knew they were worn. You knew they were weary. But brother, when it comes service time, when it came service time, it didn't matter. You get up. You strengthen yourself, you brace yourself, you put on your best clothes, you make yourself look the best you can. If you have to, you take some toothpicks and prop up the corners of your mouth. And here you go. And I've seen again and again, we'd start off a meeting and he, he was tired and weary, I could tell it. But he'd start out by faith and as he would, the anointing would begin to come on him and strength and begin. I thought, all right, we're good for another week. Here we go. How many know we live in a generation that doesn't understand this? The least bit of inconvenience, and they quit. The least bit of discomfort, and they're out. And that's why so many people are not developing. That's why so many people are out of the will of God. They never would stick it through in their training phases. They, wouldn't, they weren't willing to be disciples. Disciples are followers at any cost. Do you want to be a disciple of the Lord? Say it out loud. We're becoming. I'm becoming a true 
disciple of Jesus. Keep reading here. He said, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who's chosen him to be a soldier. Skip down to verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I what? So he's still talking about being a good soldier, isn't he? I endure all things for the elect's sake, for the church's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we'll live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, Yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. Is there a suffering according to the will of God? Yes. Now, you know, you don't hear a whole lot about that in faith circles. <laughs> because people have... Uh, they're, they're mostly talking about we don't have to suffer being sick. We don't have to suffer being broke. But that's just one side of it. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. We're not redeemed from all suffering. Selah. <laughs> uh let, let me read a couple of verses. Just You don't have to turn there. You're holding a place, aren't you? No, why not? Uh, go, go to Luke 9. You can be holding that. <laughs> uh, is there a suffering according to the will of God? There is. A good study on this is to read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, those two epistles of Peter. Basically, the subject of those two is the subject of suffering and glory. Suffering and glory. Now, this is almost a new subject to certain groups of folks. And other people, that's all they talk about is suffering. <laughs> Right, <laughs> but the pro there's a problem with it because natural people only think naturally, interpret everything as natural. Uh, you remember Jesus trying to talk to his disciples one time about the leaven of the Pharisees, and they got upset and they thought we didn't take enough bread, <laughs> and he's upset because we didn't take bread. He's got nothing to do with bread, but when you're natural. You, you try to make everything be natural. And natural people, when they hear suffering, their mind tries to turn it all into physical pain and suffering. Natural. But it's not what the Bible says. We're going to touch on some things that clearly show that that's not what he's talking about here. Uh, in the... Well, I was going to read it to you, but you need to turn to this. Go to, go to Philippians 1. I know you're holding that place, but turn to this. You can do more than one thing. Philippians 1. Are you believing God with me? Yes. This is a big subject. And I'm believing the Lord to condense it into uh, bite sizes. You can come take a bite today and come back and take another bite. And I'm excited about this because this is not just milk. And I know the Lord wouldn't give it to us, give it to you and give it to us if he didn't know we were ready for some of it. So I, I believe we're looking at some fruit of him growing us up quickly and yet solidly. And here we are talking about suffering. <laughs> now, let, let me 
go back to our example before we read this. Olympic athletes, they en endure some suffering. But is it to be pitied? No. Are they to be looked at as victims? No. Poor things, no. having to suffer. And that's the mind renewal we need about this. What is suffering? A definition of suffering means to endure pain or discomfort or unpleasantness. And that's one of the definitions of pain is feelings or sensations that are unpleasant. Well, I watched some of the games uh, uh, that were held in China there. A lot of you did, uh, the Olympics, like, like the marathon runners. Anybody see any of that? Oh, dear me. I mean, just running a marathon, in, just, just making the distance is a tremendous thing. But to run it at the pace these guys were keeping, and you could see some of them as they hit some of these, you know, marks along the route. Pain, right? Pain, I mean, their body is screaming at them. You should have quit five miles ago, right? I mean, in, in one sense, it's not normal to make your body do that. It, it, you know, that's, that's beyond. And... What do they do, though? They, they are experiencing unpleasantness, aren't they? I mean, outright searing pain sometimes. And what do they do? I mean, how many know if they, if they stopped on the side of the road and started talking about how they felt? <laughs> how their hip feels. How their left ankle feels. How their middle toe on their right foot feels. Huh? How their lungs feel. You're done. That's what you can't talk about how you feel. They set their face like flint, don't they? They got their eye on the finish line, and they got their eye on the goal, and they'll push their self past all comfort levels and past up previous performance levels, and they'll push through the pain. Right? They are suffering at times. But they don't feel bad about it. They don't feel like you ought to feel sorry for me and I'm a little victim. Why? They consider it worth the price, what they will accomplish. And that's how you and I got to think. We, we must not think, oh, I've got to suffer for Jesus. <laughs> you don't qualify. You're not ready. You don't even know what he's talking about. You've got to have the mentality that I am going to experience some unpleasantness. There are going to be some things that are, that are hard and not easy. Oh, but, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Did you find Philippians? Philippians 1 and 29. Philippians 1, 29. He said, unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to what? Suffer for, Suffer for his sake. When's the last time you confessed that? <laughs> <laughs> to suffer for his sake. Is there a suffering that's according to the will of God? Yes, there has to be. Go to Romans. Or you don't have to go there. They'll put it up on the screen for us. You hold your other places. Romans 8. And 17. Romans 8, 17. He said, if you're children, then you're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. That's a big word. That's a joint. Anybody understand anything about wills? Legal documents? What does joint heir mean? Or joint ownership? Our joint, joint heir with Christ if, <laughs> wow, if what? <laughs> Suffer. 
Michael said, I thought this was a faith church. We don't believe in suffering. <laughs> we believe in the Bible. Hmm? And whether you understand what this means or not, don't throw it out. Do you believe the Bible? Hmm? Is the Bible good? If you continue in his word, will it make you free? This is not bondage. This is freedom. If so be that we suffer with him, that what? That we may also, we may be also glorified together with him. I, I mentioned that about 1 Peter. R read 1 Peter sometime and 2 Peter. They're short. And look, at, look for the words suffer and glory. Look for them. And you'll see what I'm talking about. It's the theme that runs through that. He talks about suffering because of your own mistakes or for the glory of God. But he's not talking about suffering being sick and broke. How does me being sick help you? Not at all. If you read these phrases again and again, he says, uh, we get, got through reading 2 Timothy 2, suffering for the elect's sake, for the church, for the Lord. How does me being sick help help the church it in fact could hurt the church if I wasn't able to get up and preach this morning how does that help you how would it help you for me to be broke and can't pay my bills do you see what I'm talking about and yet this is preached by millions in the church world that me suffering being sick somehow is glorifying the Lord and helping the Lord no I'm sorry it doesn't you being sick doesn't help anybody. In fact, it hurts people. Right. Other people, are their lives are affected by it and their finances are affected by it. And instead of being a help and a strength, you have to be helped. Whether financially or whether uh, physically. Right? No, suffering for Jesus doesn't mean suffering with disease. Doesn't mean suffering being broke. And yet there is a suffering. There is a suffering that's according to the will of God. He went on to say, verse 18, and this is the part to shout about, Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. That's not a sad, woe is me, feel sorry for me, I'm suffering for Jesus. That's somebody pushing their body past where it's ever been because they are first in line. They got the gold in sight and it's hurting and their body is screaming and they got aches and pains, but they just push like they never have before. Why? Because the sufferings are not even worthy to be compared to the glory. And there are ways you and I are to apply this in following Jesus in this life right now. Can you say amen? amen? Are you holding a place somewhere? Where are you holding it? This is big. I'm having to believe God. See what to include and what not to include. Uh, Luke 9 and then find, we'll go straight from there to 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> Luke 9, verse 22. If you read more of Luke 9 and also Matthew 16, the whole story has to do with Jesus beginning to tell the disciples, who? The disciples, that he was going to suffer. Verse 22, he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain, be killed, die, and, and be raised the third day. Now, this is not what they wanted to hear. This was not what they were thinking. This was not what they had in mind. 
So much so that Peter in Matthew 16, it brings it out in more detail, took Jesus aside and said, no, 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 this shall not be to you. What do you mean? No, no, Jesus, this suffering stuff, no. What did they have in mind then? They had in mind him becoming more and more powerful and popular and overcoming and getting rid of the oppressive Roman rule and setting up the kingdom of God now. And we all live happily ever after. Yeah. And get everybody healed and everybody delivered. And he talks about suffering and dying. And they're like, no, 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 we don't believe in that suffering. No, no. <laughs> Why are you saying this, Brother Key? Because it's the same way today. But what, why, why are we talking about this? Because, I keep trying to get ahead of myself here. Because if you are a disciple of his, you will also experience suffering. Because the kingdom of God is not going to take over the kingdoms of this world now. Some people have tried to say that it will, but it won't. It's going to take him coming back to do that. We're going to get, we could get everybody saved and just take the, the government completely over and take the world over. Sorry, no. <laughs> no, it's going to take him coming back to get that done. What is that going to mean? It's going to mean that the devil is operating as the God of this world. Yes. Hmm? And the more you and I stand up for Jesus and identify with Jesus, we will be hated and we will be persecuted. And we've enjoyed a lot of freedom and not as much persecution. And one reason God, God's given us some time and opportunity here to get the gospel out. But another thing is, one reason people haven't been very persecuted is because they've been so much like the world. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things. He said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's a scripture a lot of times people don't want to think about. They just, what does that mean? It's not a negative scripture. The truth will make you free. What does it mean to deny, come after me, that's a follower of Jesus, that's a disciple of Jesus, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. What, what does it mean to take up the cross daily and follow me? That involved suffering. What kind of suffering? Uh, go to 2 Timothy 3 if you're holding that. This is ground that may not have been covered as much in, in people's thinking, but we're, we're going to camp on it till we get it straight and get it right. And we're going to be disciples of Jesus. And we're going to live happy, victorious, prosperous, healed lives. But we also can take the heat. Hmm? In the... Second Timothy, the third chapter. What kind of suffering are we talking about specifically? It says so right here. You know, when Paul got saved on the road to Damascus when he met Jesus, he told him he was going to suffer a lot of things for his name's sake. Do you remember that? He told him. Did he? Yeah, he did. And he describes some of it right here, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. 
He said, but you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, patience, persecutions. Somebody say persecutions. Afflictions which came to me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra. What persecutions? Somebody say persecutions. I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Now get this, get this. Yea, yes, and all. How many? All. A-L-L. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer being sick. No. No. Being broke forever? No, no. What? Persecution. Is that what Paul experienced? Yeah, just, uh, I'll read it to you in 2 Corinthians 11. He gives a list of some of the things he, he went through endeavoring to follow the Lord. 2 Corinthians 11, I'll just read them to you. He said, uh, are they ministers of Christ? Verse 23 of 11, I'm more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often of the Jews. Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Five different occasions he was beat like that. Three times I was beaten with rods. He had, these are different kind of beatings, with sticks. He had a lot of experience getting beat. Once I was stoned. Now, for most people, that's all you ever get stoned because you're dead. <laughs> Once. <laughs> but God raised him up. Remember, he was, he was down on the ground. They thought he was dead. The disciples stood around it. They thought he was dead, and he got up. He got up. Oh, now, now, here's a beautiful picture. He got up, the Bible said, and went right back into the town where they stoned him and preached the gospel. And I guess didn't say one word about how he felt. <laughs> Can you see him enduring hardness? Like a good soldier. Is that like a highly trained Olympic athlete? Is that, you know, man, he knew how to let his spirit carry him and push past. That's, that's what he was talking about. He said, if it had been possible, you'd have pulled out your eyes and given them to me. Why? The head is the principal target when you get stoned. They throw rocks to the head because that's where they want to hit to kill you, you know. And so he, you know, the fact that he's raised up, we shouldn't assume that all of his wounds were instantly healed. We have indications that they healed up naturally because he said later, he said, don't bother, I'm, this is Keith Moore paraphrase, don't mess with me. I got in my body the scars of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they healed up, and so his eyes were probably bloodshot and swollen and, and his face and everything else. And in that state, he preached. He preached. He taught. Glory. Wasn't afraid of dying. I said he wasn't afraid of dying. He had a master. He was following. Somebody say, I do too. He said, three times I was beaten with rods. I, one time I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And every time I read that, I think, with the sharks. <laughs> right? I mean, all night and all day, out in the middle of the ocean, bombing up and down like a cork. In journeyings often, perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils by my own countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness, painfulness, watchings, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, nakedness, and beside all those things, he's talked about the care of the church. Is that suffering? Pain? You know what's conspicuous for its absence in this list? Disease. I'm going to understand, if you are very sick, how are you going to make it through all that? <laughs> if you were very weak, you wouldn't have made it a night and a day out in the deep. 
you couldn't have stood five different beatings. Forty stripes. Three rod beatings. You, if you were just, you had to be pretty healthy. Plus the miracle power of God to make it through this. <laughs> glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. Are you holding a place still? Go to John 15 then. Let me give you one. I think I can close with this. Is there a suffering according to the will of God? Yes. yes. Enduring hardness, enduring discomfort, unpleasantness. Is it a part of being a disciple of the Lord? Yes, yes it is. And you can sum it up in this word, persecution. That scripture again, this is so important now. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Is it true or not? How many? All. All. In John 15 and 18. Now, in thinking about this, don't, don't miss the obvious things. You think, well, yeah, I need to think about that. Would I be willing to be a martyr for Jesus? Would I be willing to do this? Uh, okay, but how about would you be willing to stand outside in the cold with a flashlight in the parking lot? You see what I'm saying? So many times people want to get romantic ideas and talk about the extreme and they got things facing them right here and they're not willing to be uh, discomforted in any degree. You know, Phyllis and I and leadership's in a position to see, but we've, there's all kind of people that should be doing things in the ministry and should still be doing things. They've quit for no good reason. Other people take their place and are getting their reward. Yes, but people say, well, I got tired and I got this and I got, and, and they, they think that they're just serving us. Did y'all hear me now? Or they think, well, I'm just helping the church. This is your church. These are your flowers you're planting. This is yours, right? And I'm not your master. I'm your coach. Saying, serve the master, serve the master. Yay, go, serve the master. I'm serving the master. You serve the master. We serve the master. You're not my disciple. You're not to become my disciple, his disciple. But we should take seriously. When the Lord directs you to do something, I, I know some years ago I learned something about this. A man had told me he was going to help me in a certain area of ministry. I didn't ask him to. But he said, when the Lord dealt with me, Brother Keith, I'm supposed to do this. So he did it for just a little while. And then he came and he said, you know, I'm not going to do it anymore. And, and, and we, we kind of needed it. I mean, it was something that's going to be a hole if he just goes away. But I, I, I dare not ask him. I dare not say anything because you understand service, unless it's done willingly, is not acceptable to the Lord. We can't be moved by what we need as, as ministers and as a church. And... Uh, so I told him, I said, that's okay. That's all right. That's fine. And, and I, I didn't make a deal out of it, and, and I wasn't going to. And, and uh, I didn't want to affect our friendship. And so he, he went on. And as he left, and I started to go home, the Lord spoke to me. I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside me. He said, just because you said it was okay doesn't mean I said it's okay. I thought, hmm. I said, well, Lord, I can't say anything about that, can I? He said, no, I'm not telling you to say anything, but I just want you to know. Just because you told them it was okay not to do it doesn't mean I told them it was not okay. Or it was okay, that I told them it was okay. So we, we need to get our eyes off of men, don't we? And off of each other and realize who we're really serving. And when the Lord tells you to do something, you know, your, your reward, your full anointing, your full training is all dependent on it. How many remember Elijah and Elisha? Remember that? Eli Elisha is serving Elijah, not because Elijah called him, the Lord called him, right? 
The Lord told him to do that. And so as they're going, you know, toward the end of Elijah's ministry, he said, I'm going to such and such place. You can stay here. He's telling him, you don't have to go. You can stay. We're tired. It's a long trip. I'm going to go on. You don't. What did he say? He said, oh, no. No, as the Lord lives and as you live, I'm going. The Lord told me to do this. I, I'm with. Even if sometimes people tell you you don't have to, you need to be willing to say, oh, no, no. And he's not telling him you can't go. He's telling him you don't have to. You're tired. You can rest. And sometimes you need to pop up and say, oh, no, uh-uh. I'm, as long as you're here, I'm here till it's done. Now, do you know what I'm talking about? People talk about, would I die for Jesus? Well, how about living for him in the afternoon? <laughs> how about getting cold? How about staying up late? How about missing a meal? You know, let's don't be foolish about these things and have romantic notions of it. Let's, it's easy to theorize and talk about someday, some way I might have to suffer for Jesus. No, today, are we willing to do anything? Right now, right here. So John 15 says this. Jesus said it. 15 and 18. He said, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Now let's just stop right here. If the world is okay with you and has no problem with you, is that a good sign? All, how many? All. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What if you're not suffering any persecution? Ever. It means you're not living godly in Christ Jesus. You may be a believer, but you're not living godly in Christ Jesus to the degree that you should. You're too much like the world. And if the world looks at you and they think you look like them and talk like them and act like them and live like them, well, they got no problem with you. We're alike. But when, when you begin to become more like him, things are going to change. Are you reading with me? He said, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world, what? That's what I was talking about earlier now. Are we going to get all the world saved and everybody love us now? Uh-uh. It's going to take Jesus coming back to get that done. So, yes, let's reach everybody we can. But you just got to know this, that the more you live like him and the more you think like him, and what is the purpose of discipleship? To become like him. Well, here's what's going to happen when you become more like him. The world will hate you because they hate him. As long as you're like them, they got no problem with you. So no persecution. But the more you become like him, but friend, I have a desire. Yes, sir. I said, I have a desire. Yes. I want to preach like he preached. Yes, Did everybody like what he preached? No, they wanted to kill him over it. Yes. If we're making no ripples, if the world doesn't care, it's because we're too much like them. Right. Now, we don't want to try to be bizarre and strange, but we want to be like Jesus. Yes. And when we think like him, and to, how many think we could have miracles like he had? Yes that shake communities and shake. We could have revelation like he did, faith exploits like he did. And when you do, the church will love it. People that love God will love it. The world will hate it. I said the world will hate it. And they'll hate you. And they'll persecute you. And when the persecution begins to come, you don't need to fold up and back off. What if it costs me my job? wasn't your source anyway. What if it cost me my place here? What if it cost me this? What if it cost me that? That's where some of the suffering comes in. Right? Are we believing God? This is serious stuff, isn't it? Are you willing, though? 
And is it worth paying the price? Is it worth, the sufferings are not even worthy to be compared, the Bible said, to the glory that shall be revealed. Keep reading. He said, verse 20, remember the word I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. That's our verse, our text, right? Of being a disciple. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. Did they persecute him? Yes. yes. So if you're really his disciple, what will be one sign of it? Persecution. You are going to catch some. Amen. If they've kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do to you for my name's sake because they know not him that sent me. Stand on your feet, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Let's lift up our hearts to the Lord for a moment here. Father, we thank you. We worship you. We exalt you. We glorify you. We magnify you. Pray this out loud, everybody. Say, Father God, work in me to will and to do of all your good pleasure. I desire to be like the Master. I present myself to be your disciple, to follow you, to learn of you, to become like you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Father, any ways that we've been like the world, I pray that you'd show it to us. Help us to grow out of it and change and not just not, not be conformed to the ungodly world that we live in and round about us. Yes, thank you. You're doing it even now. Thank you, Lord. But help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we think like the Master. Oh, that we see like the Master, that we hear like the Master, that we believe and become like the Master. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just pray in the Spirit a little bit by faith that He is unfolding Himself to you that you may become truly like Him. Oh, thank you. Nehite. Thank you. 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 Pray this out loud. Lord, Father, forgive us for being weak in times past, for talking about our feelings, allowing them to govern us instead of following you. Strengthen us with strength by your Spirit in our inner man. Make us very strong for your service, and we will serve you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Oh, I have decided to follow Jesus. And again, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Phyllis. Hallelujah. 
thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, I was standing there and I was thinking about the first time I heard a message like that decades ago. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't receive it. I got upset about it and I went to Keith and I told him, I said, I don't want to fight. I don't want to endure anything else. I'm tired of doing things like this. I, I thought it was going to be easy when you started serving God. Anybody feel that way? Yeah. But you know what? I realized as he was telling that about the athletes. I realized that you ever seen the athletes, if you've ever seen them, what they do is, yes, they press toward the gold. But what they do is, is they have victories all along the way. They're pressing toward their, their little county meets, and they win those. And then they press toward their state meets, and they win those. And they have victories. And they're overcoming all the time. They have faith victories all the time, and they're growing all the time. But if they don't ever do it, then they're losing all the time. They don't know that victory. They don't know that winning spirit. They don't know what it feels like to have obtained something like that. Well, that's what I realize now. I realize now that that's where the devil wanted to keep me. He wanted to keep me in a place that I would never fight. That I would never know what it was like to win a battle. He wanted to keep me where I didn't know what faith was. Where I would never believe God over a headache. Or I would never believe God how to get $5 or how to get $10 or how to get $50 for this week's bills. And that's where he wants to keep you. Not to endure. Not to stand. Not to take that step. But... You're going to fight one way or the other or you're going to go under. You're either going to fight the devil's battles and stay defeated all the time. Or you're going to get on this side. You're going to get on God's side. And you're going to have victories all the time. And win victories for God. And see what it feels like to win and be victorious. Because it feels good. Because when you're enduring for God, you're happy. And you're victorious. And it's like you're winning golds all the time. How many of you ever won a faith battle? Oh, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? A lot different than it does on the other side. So don't let the devil lie to you and tell you this is a hard thing. It's not. It's a glorious thing. It's a glorious thing. So close your eyes for just a minute. Let's do this right. Father God, we submit ourselves to you. Here and now. Satan, you're bound. You will not keep us down. We will win. We'll do what you say do. We'll win these battles. We'll, we'll, Lord, we'll win these battles. <laughs> Satan is bound. We are victorious. We are overcomers. We are winners. All of us will win to the end. In Jesus' name.